Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Megan, and I'm one of our events associates here at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Today, we will be discussing opposing Wisconsin's unco unconstitutional hunter protection laws, a discussion and analysis. This webinar does offer closed captioning. To turn on, just click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. We will have <clears throat> Q&A, so feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A icon at any time. Today joining us are Amanda Howell, Mark Leitner, and John Watson. I will introduce Amanda and then let her introduce our guests, Mark and John. As a managing attorney for the Animal Legal Defense Fund, Amanda, Amanda uses her background in strategic impact litigation to help us win big for the animals. She is dedicated to using her skills to combat inequity and believes that changing how we view and treat animals will simultaneously improve life for all sentient beings and positively impact individual health, public health, and our environment. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Amanda. Thanks so much, Megan. I'm so happy to be here and very happy that uh, John and Mark are joining us today. Um, John Watson has a PhD in political science and environmental policy. He's been an adjunct professor of political science and public policy at the University of Illinois at Chicago since 2008. He is the author of the 2016 book, Prairie Crossing, Creating an American Conservation Community. A part-time resident of Wisconsin, John owns a nature property there where he is an avid birder, amateur wildlife photographer, and conservationist. Mark Leitner is a trial lawyer and a founding partner of Laffey, Leitner & Good in Milwaukee. For more than 39 years, he's been trying cases and arguing appeals in state and federal courts across the country. He is one of Wisconsin's premier First Amendment lawyers, having won major victories for free speech, including in Brown v. Kemp case that we'll be discussing today, um, defamation lawsuits against animal rights groups and civil rights organizations, and on behalf of college students. Thank you, John and Mark, for being here today. I'm very uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Um, so those of you familiar with the Animal Legal Defense Fund, this is our mission. Um, one way that we effectuate our mission is to ensure that members of the public can access true information about the various ways humans treat animals, often cruelly, in ways that we can't avoid. Uh, we have a vested interest in ensuring free speech in the form of sharing information about that system, including by documenting the behavior of those who hunt animals for sport. Um, we'll be discussing today Brown v. Kemp, which is an unequivocal win from the Seventh Circuit on a First Amendment challenge against a Wisconsin law that prohibited people from interfering with a hunt, uh, a prohibition that led to law enforcement threats and seizure of recording equipment when uh, one plaintiff tried documenting a wolf hunt on public land. Uh, we lost on pre-enforcement standing issues at the district court level. Uh, we then appealed and won on both standing and the merits in this 91 page opinion and dissent. By way of background, um, this is the Wisconsin statute as it was originally enacted uh, back in 1990. Um, the prior law said that you basically could not, with the intent of uh, prevent, uh, intent to prevent taking of a wild animal, physically interfere with a hunter. And so it only applied to physical interference with hunting and fishing. Um, and it's it's a, not a great law, but uh, and one of the most concerning things I would say is that it didn't limit enforcement to public prosecutors and law enforcement officials. So anyone adversely affected by the violative conduct could bring an action in civil court for an injunction or damages. So in short, it's not just the state action that's an issue here, but also hunters could seek that injunction and damages too. So not great, but uh, then we have in 2016, um, the legislature amended the law. Um, so this is the beginning part, and this is the relevant part, subsection 2A7. It added three prohibitions that didn't entail any sort of that physical interference with the obstruction of, or obstruction of hunting. Um, so it basically said that you cannot, in these amendments said that you cannot intentionally interfere with hunting uh, by maintaining a physical, vi visual or physical proximity. You couldn't approach or, approach or confront or you couldn't photo photograph, videotape, or monitor through electronic means, and that included using a drone to, to do those things. Um, so those, those amendments were uh, deeply problematic. Um, as a result of those amendments, uh, we brought this lawsuit, uh, Brown v. Kemp, in the Western District of Wisconsin. Um, plaintiffs Joseph Brown, Louis Weisberg, and Stephanie Lossie brought a pre-enforcement First Amendment challenge 
after they were regularly stopped, questioned, threatened with citations, having their film linking equipment confiscated. Um, Plaintiff Joseph Brown was a professor at Marquette University who opposed wolf hunting. He made documentary films to further that debate. He was filming wolf hunters uh, and wolf patrols uh, monitoring activities for several years as part of the documentary film about the pros and cons of wolf hunting in Wisconsin. Um, he worked with volunteers with Wolf Patrol and he had amassed over 300 hours of documentary video of hunting in Wisconsin. Um, plaintiff Stephanie Lossi uh, was an environmental and animal rights advocate and Wolf Patrol volunteer. Uh, she monitored hunting activities for illegal and inhumane conduct and took photographs and videos of hunting activities to use in educational materials for the public. Uh, lastly, plaintiff Lewis Weisberg was a journalist who had a professional interest in documenting and reporting on hunting in Wisconsin. Uh, he advocated on behalf of Wisconsin wolves and bears and through his work provided an outlet for organizations like Wolf Patrol to share with the public their perspective on issues related to hunting. Um, so in 2017, plaintiffs filed this lawsuit seeking a declaration that this amendment, sub, subsection 2A7 of the Wisconsin, Wisconsin Hunt Harassment Law was unconstitutional on its face, on its face and as applies to them. Um, they sought an injunction against enforcement um, and argued that subsection 2A7 was unconstitutionally vague and overbroad, chilled the exercise of First Amendment rights and was viewpoint based and failed to survive uh, strict scrutiny. Um, unfortunately, the district court disagreed. They held that plaintiffs lacked standing to bring their as applied and facial challenges. They said that they lacked Article 3 standing to assert pre enforcement. They said that plaintiffs didn't put forth sufficient ev evidence to demonstrate that their conduct was arguably prescribed by the statute um, and that they and the district court didn't think that the threat of future enforcement was substantial. Um, thanks in part to district attorneys and federal and state law enforcement saying that the conduct um, that produced the wolf patrol videos didn't constitute inter interference with hunting, fishing, or trapping. Um, the court was able to sidestep having to really examine the law. Um, the court also, the district court also rejected the overbreadth and vagueness challenges on the merits. Um, that said, after we lost at the district court level, we appealed to the Seventh Circuit, and the Seventh Circuit uh, reversed and remanded. The Seventh Circuit held that plaintiffs did indeed have su standing sufficient for pre-enforcement review, um, that their conduct was ar argu arguably prescribed by the statute. Um, that their activities are speech and they were not just pure conduct, um, that the First Amendment protection did extend to activities necessary to produce and disseminate that speech, and they did establish risk of enforcement. Um, the court also held that the statute was unconstitutionally vague and overbroad. Um, with that background in mind, I'm going to stop sharing and get into the exciting part of our webinar, which is the question and discussion portion with John and Mark. Um, I think the first question I have is going to be actually for John. Um, just by way of context and background, what are the legal and social and political conditions that led to the passage of the 1990 Hunter Interference Law? Uh, thank you for having me. I think the uh, Legal Defense Fund has done a real service, struck a blow for, for freedom of speech and also dissemination to a lot of the people that are attending here, giving them information about how to um, organize themselves politically for the values that are important uh, to them. Let me, let me start with the social conditions. A uh, little bit of background. Wisconsin has the seventh most licensed hunters of all the 50 states. Now that sounds um, like a lot, but numerically, they're, they're relatively small. More than 88% of Wisconsinites are not licensed hunters. So it's, a, it's only 11.7%, but it is very integral to their to Wisconsin uh, culture. So fishing, hunting, and trapping, and the taking of game are actually enshrined in the, the state constitution and can only be subjected to reasonable uh, reg regulation. Um, the hunting and gun rights lobby is very well organized and it's very well funded. But even non-hunters seem to acquiesce in, in um, 
the hunting culture. So some of this is based upon my 14 years of, of living there. Some of it's anecdotal. Some of it's backed up by, by stats. But during the nine day rifle season, they actually take almost a quarter of a million white tailed deer in nine days. And those are just the ones that reported. It doesn't include uh, surely some that are taken uh, illegally. But you'll see people wearing blaze, driving their grocery in their car. Uh, um, and uh, uh, hunting is perceived as a status activity. This is how I see it. So give an example from the local pub. If anyone mentions hunting, you'll, you'll see the cell phones whip out and they, they got to show you the biggest buck that they've got and some of it I think is, is in, in the old days you had to take a film camera with you and then go to Walgreens and develop it but now these these cameras uh the the status is very very important um in in my experience in central Wisconsin I'm not really going to say where I'm from or mention any names uh or, or anything like that, but it, it, is, it ceased to be a sportsman activity as I see it. So I live on a road that has uh, uh, quite a few DNR hunting grounds on the other side of the street, not on my side of the street, but I pass them when I, I walk my dog. I'll find cans of buck urine, cigarette butts, uh, apple scent. They use uh, plastic decoys, life-size, plastic decoys of course they use high powered rifles with uh with a scope and really disturbingly i find cans of what they call nose jammer it's like a chemical aerosol that is designed to disarm the uh the, the sense of smell on on the deer and disable it and so it's not really a sport it's kind of a stacked against them where some hunters are actually taking deer that are 250 50 yards away. And oftentimes, unlike natural selection, where predators like wolves, which was the subject of Mr. Brown's documentary, they take the old, the sick, the weak, the ill-adapted. Uh, um, the, the bucks seem to be the major feature. The bigger, the better. And they're taking some of the best genes um, out of the gene pool, which is uh, managed by DNR to maximize deer prop uh, populations. Hunting socialization starts early, like eight, 10 years old. Uh, the local uh, advert uh, uh, newspaper have pictures of 10 year old girl with a male tom, a male turkey that she, she got. Uh, they have a youth hunt there. And the culture, in my opinion, really commoditizes nature, that nature doesn't have an intrinsic value uh, um, there. Uh, and seldom do I hear them talk about the, the deer in terms of meat or venison or food. It's, it's mostly, mostly trophy oriented. And the gun culture there, what my colleague at UIC calls uh, the first freedom, that guns are the freedom that secures all others. Let me move on to political conditions. Some may or may not know this. It's kind of like a politically schizophrenic state. You've got Tammy Baldwin, who has an LCV score, that's League of Conservation uh, voter score of 97%, and her colleague has only 6%. So oftentimes it's as though Wisconsin doesn't even have a vote as Tammy votes for the environment and, and uh, um, Ron votes, votes against it. Of their 10 members of the Wisconsin delegation, only three have an LCV score greater than 14%. So what that means is uh, League of Conservation voters gives a score on particular bills that have an environmental uh, aspect to it. And sometimes voting no um, can actually be voting in favor of the environment, but only three of the 10 vote for the environment at least 15% of the time, which is, uh, um, you know, a little, little bit disturbing. It's the, it was and remains to be seen with the new redistricting what will happen, but it's the most gerrymandered state in the country. 
And uh, consequently, the latest state Supreme Court election um, resulted in more money being spent than any judicial election in, in, in history. Um, uh, Governor Walker, um, during his, his two terms, was, was very divisive. He's the lame duck governor who signed the 2016 amendments into, into law. And um, DNR itself has been kind of leaderless. Well, not kind of. It has been leaderless for the last year and hasn't had a confirmed secretary in more than two, two years. So there's not a lot of di direction there. Um, if we get to that question later, we'll talk about how DNR is kind of a captured agency. It has been co-opted by hunting and gun right inter uh, interests. And uh, um, this uh, decision struck a real judicial blow in mitigating the power of sub-governments, those, those agencies that operate under the radar. And uh, the system worked as it's intended to by our founding fathers. And then uh, the Judiciary Act is a check and balance. I do want to know more about the, the agency capture maybe um, further on, but I really sure. am curious, John, about you know, we had this law in 1990 and you know it's protecting hunters. What was the catalyst for the 2016 amendment? Why did they feel like that was necessary? Um, that's a good question. It was kind of spear one of the spearheads of this uh, um, amendment was uh, Adam Jarka. He actually peer appears in Mr. Brown's uh, uh, film and he, uh, he ran many of the hearings. He's a first term legislator, a, a uh, avid hunter. And I, in my opinion, he's trying to make a name for himself. So he would later go on to run for state senator and he, he, he lost that and then ran for uh, the GOP nomination for state attorney general. So I think he was really trying to cater to the, the power of the gun and hunting rights uh, interests in, in the state. And so he, uh, fruit. Like he knew that there was so much cultural support for this. This was just something to bolster. Yeah, up. yeah. In, in, in terms of... Um, um, the Iron Triangle, which I'll come to later, which is state legislators, gun and hunting rights lobby, and bureaucratic agencies like D DNR, a numerical minority that's very well organized and very well funded and has organizations like the NRA, Ducks Unlimited, and all these organizations that can churn out the vote and churn out campaign contributions. Uh, I believe this is a way for him Mr. Jarkov to, to make a big splash as uh, he, he was an, in fact a lawyer, a native Wisconsinite, he came back and um, he, uh, um, if you watch the trailer, which I recommend, it's only two and a half minutes long, you just put in Wolf Patrol in the YouTube and it pops right up. Um, he, he was very aggressive and very hostile to animal rights groups, yeah. It's interesting that you that he was a lawyer because um, this, this next question I think is maybe from Mark. Sure. Because, you know the 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 text kind of steps in it in terms of adding adding a constitutional infirmity. Um, yeah. So I think part of that is the the viewpoint discrimination that the 2016 amendments kind of really harped on. So, Mark, if if you could explain to us like how this law is a strong example of the concept of sure. viewpoint discrimination. And, and I think there, there are four yeah. kinds of laws for First Amendment purposes, and I'm going to discuss them from least harmful to free speech to most harmful to free speech. Least harmful to free speech is it just a, a good old-fashioned law of general application that says uh, you cannot run a stop sign. And it doesn't matter in that situation. If I run the stop sign, in order to in, in order to promote my belief that stop signs should be run, uh, it, that that doesn't matter. A law of general application simply applies uh, to to conduct, and uh, it isn't particularly relevant whether you're trying to communicate a message through that conduct. Uh, the second level up is a regulation of speech uh, that's just intended legitimately and honestly, and these are very rare. Uh, intended to be uh, a time, place, and manner uh, restriction on speech. 
In other words, uh, it's fine to have a parade. Uh, it is not fine to have a parade at 2 a.m. Uh, it's fine to have a fundraising picnic at the prime site in your local county park, but it's also not uh, uh, fine to have five people having a out and out brawl over who gets to use that prime spot. Uh, there are legitimate kinds of uh, restrictions. One of the classic one is a Supreme Court case from the 1940s that says uh, you can't have a sound truck after certain hours of uh, the evening going through uh, blasting your message around. Sometimes we, we say people have to tolerate that uh, even if they disagree with the message and if it's a, a momentary disturbance, we have to tolerate that at certain times of the day in, in, uh, in pursuit of free speech, but not at 24 hours a day. And so that's the, the second uh, and, and slightly, le slightly less acceptable because even if it is a legitimate objective uh, regulating that time, place and manner of communication, uh, a lot of the time those, those laws are stalking horses for uh, efforts to try to uh, to try to actually restrict speech, and uh, and the courts have uh, uh, further things that they will look at. Uh, in particular, does this have an effect on certain kinds of speech or speech by certain groups of people? Uh, but again, that's not what we're dealing with here. Uh, then the next up is a content uh, uh, discrimination. In other words, a uh, a regulation of speech that uh, disfavors one particular subject area. Uh, and, uh, and that is, uh, that is uh, 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 there's a strong presumption against legislation like that being constitutional, precisely because uh, it is, uh, it, that aims right at the substance of what, a, what is being communicated. And that's the biggest threat to the First Amendment. And finally, the most vulnerable type of legislation is what we have here, which is viewpoint discrimination. Uh, the law could have said anyone who is uh, present in these situations uh, in, in the, uh, in the uh, area of hunters or, or, or uh, uh, people who are fishing or otherwise engaged in uh, in the in photography or taking of uh, of animals, um, anybody, whether they're there to promote hunting to uh, to because they're in a, a group like Wolf Patrol that is trying to call attention to why we shouldn't have hunting, uh, no matter what side you're on, uh, you could write the law like that, and that's content discrimination. But here the law says. These things are unlawful only if you have intent to interfere with the hunt. Mm -hmm. And so it is a viewpoint discrimination. It is expressly targeted toward one side of the public debate. And that's the most vulnerable kind of law at all, because it is, it is so offensive to the heart of what the First Amendment is all about. And that's why they applied strict scrutiny. Yes, strict scrutiny is, strict scrutiny is another way of saying, uh-uh. Uh, because what if you manage to get your uh, as as an advocate for free speech, if you manage to get the court to apply strict scrutiny, then uh, there are uh, man. I mean, there might be three, four, five cases across the country that have said yes, strict scrutiny applies, and yes, this law passes strict scrutiny. It is a uh, I don't know them, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it, I mean, it literally almost never happens. And, yeah. uh, and it, what it requires is uh, you, you have to, you have to, government then has to prove that there is no less restrictive means. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the means here of restricting, uh, of, of restricting certain kinds of speech or proximity or uh, the, the things that are prohibited by. Uh, by statute, uh, by section seven sub C, and uh, and then you have the ends that are supposedly served by that uh, by that regulation. And here are the ends, and we're going to talk about this in greater detail. So I'll just mention it now. The ends that the state identified as legitimate justifications were really two. Number one is uh, we are promoting Wisconsin hunting culture, which is a constitutional value, uh, as John noted. Uh, 
and uh, and we are also uh, uh, keeping the woods safe because we now we won't have all these people running around with cameras uh, 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 in proximity to a whole bunch of people who have guns who don't like them. And uh, neither of those, and we'll talk uh, we'll talk about why neither of those explanations held any water. Yeah, we're talking about overbreadth and vagueness. Uh, be, uh, but uh, but those were the justifications. And the, the you know, important thing is that for strict scrutiny, uh, you have to have a, a direct and immediate means and relationship. In other words, the government has got to be able to show that because we passed this statute, it will promote hunting. Because we passed this statute, it will make the woods safe. Well, there are ways to to show that it won't. Uh, which we use, but that's the that that is a very very onerous burden for the government, because all you have to do is come up with one counter example of uh, of something that the statute didn't cover, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, overbreadth. Well, you're you know you say you want to protect against this, but here's a whole bunch of things that you are not pro uh, uh, pro uh, 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 prohibiting that uh, that you. You know that that you didn't include in the statute, but that would help you achieve this goal. So the the uh, the 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 level of scrutiny is is often the uh, the decision by a court that uh, that really announces what the result is going to be before you even get there. I did think it, there was uh, in the decision there was a note nine, um, and I thought that was super interesting because they basically said that even they would have reached the same conclusion, even if a lower level of scrutiny, even if they had applied like rational basis scrutiny. Right. And I, I, I found that kind of just like, just dropping that in a footnote. I was like, well, that's really interesting. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, that, that was, you know, because that's one of the arguments is that the state was really pushing is that well, you should, you should use a lower level of scrutiny and they wanted, essentially, they were, they were asking the court to treat this like one of those time, place, and manner regulations. That all we're doing is when people are out in the woods, these are these things that we want to prohibit. And the court, uh, and, and that is basically the what, what they call the intermediate level of scrutiny. I mean, in, in rational basis scrutiny, all you have to do is come up with it. You know, it doesn't even have to be what, this, what, what the legislature actually thought about or intended, you have to come up with some sort of plausible, even hypothetical rationale, and it, and it gets the thumbs up. It is really the flip side of the strict scrutiny coin. If When a government gets rational basis review, it is about to get permission to do whatever it wants. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in uh, it, But when we have a, a legitimate time, place, and manner regulation, you still have to show a, uh, a significant relationship between the objective of the statute and uh, and how broadly it sweeps. You have to, uh, it's, 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 you know, rational basis with teeth. And the court noted in that footnote nine that the state hasn't really done anything mm -hmm. to justify this law. Uh, that, uh, and, and this is literally something that happened during oral argument. Uh, one of the judges, uh, uh, Judge Rovner and Judge Hamilton also, who were the two judges that wound up voting with us, uh, both of those judges asked the uh, assistant attorney general arguing for the state several times, can you think of one thing that this law prohibits mm -hmm. that was not also prohibited by the 1990 version of this law? And they were unable completely to do that, which suggests this was put in here I mean, it has no legal function at all because everything that you want to achieve, all the goals that you want to promote, uh, were perfectly well promoted by the law before it was amended. They were so annoyed by that that made it into the opinion too. Yeah. <laughs> that no, that was that was that was because you should be able to say, well, we have solved the problem by doing this, and this is what the problem was, and they were not able to do that. That that was yeah. that was just a, a, a near fatal concession. Yeah. So all this is about the substance and the merits of the constitutional challenge. What I worried about and what I continue to, you know, to worry about and keep keeps me up at night is how worried do we need to be about well-settled First Amendment law shifting? And I mean specifically about, you know, it seems like the standing issue is an increasing way that courts are punting and not dealing with you know First Amendment challenges. So I thought that the standard for for the challenge, what they were the district court and maybe even the appellate court 
saying what what was needed to establish um, standing for pre-enforcement challenge was a little bit high. You know that people already had been detained and things confiscated and citations trying to be issued. When, then, when, oh, what, sorry. Go ahead. Oh yeah, and then just again um, the and then also with the standing issue of people saying, oh well, this just doesn't apply. That your your conduct isn't prescribed by the law, so we're fine. We don't actually need to get to the constitutional merits here. Uh, I've seen that in a couple of my cases. So is this is this an increasing thing? Is this something that standing? Know? I don't think standing is even law. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think it reaches to that level because it depends what court you're in. It depends which side of the bed the judge got out of. It depends whose political ox is being gored. Uh, it, it isn't law. It's you might as well flip coins. Uh, and you see that extremely well in this decision because you read the district court's decision and you're all black, black. Absolutely 100% black. Then you get to the uh, Court of Appeals and it's no, 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 absolutely white. There isn't a, a, you know, not a shade of gray involved here. And uh, it's the same thing. And it, you, you should usually get pretty consistent agreement on what results should happen uh, if you're actually talking about a real legal system. And one of the reasons you, uh, that, that standing is such a joke is that it is infinitely manipulable. Now, here, I, I think that, that that the whole idea, uh, you got to remember when we filed this case, nothing had been done to uh, to uh, 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 Dr. Brown or any of our other plaintiffs. Uh, they were fearful of what would be done because of, uh, uh, among other things, the fact that you note in your introduction that there were uh, private enforcement mechanisms as well as prosecution here. And fortunately, none of those ever came to take, came to be because I don't think anybody wanted to be on the on the wrong end of a lawsuit. There, uh, they certainly made plenty of threats. Uh, and if you watch the trailer in the movie, you will see those. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't actually carry through and start any uh, any any proceedings. The uh, the thing about pre enforcement is we brought the lawsuit as a pre enforcement suit, but halfway through. Uh, Dr. Brown's uh, camera, his, his camera, his his film, uh, it, it was confiscated as part of a uh, an investigation into uh, into a uh, a potential citation, and they kept it for I think it was nine ten months, and that was nine and nine or ten months when he was just not able to work on his documentary, and you talk about a chilling effect. Yeah, <laughs> okay. and, and that's one of the things that that the the that it's a major factor is if this kind of law is sitting out there, even if it's not enforced, the sword is hanging over your head, and mm -hmm. as a result, you will cut back on activities that you have an absolute right to do uh, as a United States citizen under the first, or as a person in the United States as a, uh, a, a under the First Amendment, mm -hmm. and that's just wrong and. Uh, and that's and what they, they wanted. You know, pardon? they wanted to chill. They wanted to discourage people. Absolutely, that was the whole purpose yeah. of this yeah. representative. <laughs> you know, if you go through the legislative history, it's absolute outright hostility it, to people it, uh, based on their political belief. It couldn't they, possibly have been clearer. For sure. And what what really gets gets me is that they want their cake to eat and also to eat it too. They want to like discourage people, chill speech, but also say, oh, this doesn't apply to you and we're never going to work. Well, you don't, don't intend to, so don't worry about it. And the court rightly recognized that that dodge, uh, you know, which is often used in these cases, yeah. saying, well, you said you won't, uh, you don't intend to violate it, then you're okay. And a lot of courts buy into that. And it's embarrassing that they do, because if there's anything... First of all, nobody ever proved intent directly other than against a really, really stupid defendant uh, who admitted, yes, I'm out to break the law or a, a highly principled defendant, one or the other. Uh, no, but in, in any case of any consequence, intent is proven through circumstantial evidence. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. You don't get a if you if they prosecuted you under this law, and you came in and said, I didn't intend it. They would say, oh, sorry. We made a mistake. Yeah, oh, I had known that. That never happens. And I, so the fact that there's an intent requirement means nothing whatsoever because intent is, uh, is and, and Judge Connolly even recognized that in his decision. He recognized it and then he proceeded to ignore it as he as he did his, his reasoning, uh, 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 which is why it's really a, a, an example of a judge who grew up in Rice Lake, Wisconsin, up north and wanted to 
come down on the side of the culture that he grew up on, in which yeah. is, I think, the best explanation yeah. for that, because he's generally a pretty good judge. Um, I agree with you, Mark, about the the standing and what side of the bed someone woke up on or what side of the political, you know, proclivities they kind of woke up on, which I think it brings me to a question for John, like, is this law, is this case, is everything, is, it, is this just a manifestation of agency capture and what can the Wisconsin DNR do to improve their organization to kind of like limit that um, from, you know, what you said, like 11% of the population kind of like creating this, this situation for the entirety of the population? Yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, I actually use it in my, my uh, environmental policy class as a case exemplar. It's one of the best examples of in the jargon, what they call uh, uh, an iron triangle or a sub, sub government. Uh, it, it results, it distorts public policy and it results in agency capture. So you'll have us, in this case, it's DNR, it's a state regulatory agency. It is supposed to regulate hunting, but what actually happens is it gets co op by the power of the gun and hunting rights lobby and kind of dictates to uh, DNR what they're supposed to do. And DNR views the hunting rights lobby or hunters as an organized clientele. They are Department of Natural Resources and natural resources belong to everyone mm -hmm. and they have multiple, multiple uses. So they call it an iron triangle because it has three elements. In this case, it's the Wisconsin State Legislature, then the special interests of the gun and hunting rights lobby and, a, and of course, uh, DNR. It's a very, very stable alliance and it's based on a, a symbiotic political relationship. Each element gives one of the other elements something and it gets something in return. So for example, state legislature, um, they give this favorable hunting protection law to the hunters. And when you watch the actual film, I've watched, I, I bought the film, I've watched the film and I've watched the trailer uh, a million times seemingly. Um, the, the hunters are very aware of the power of this law. And they honestly, I, I think it's a fair, <clears throat> a fair observation. They abuse Mr. Brown and Mr. Coronado and Miss Lossie uh, and, and the other members of the Wolf Patrol. What the state legislature gets in return is campaign contributions so they can get reelected they get uh, uh, votes, they churn out for these votes, and DNR gives implementation, favorable implementation of the laws. Uh, 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 Mark mentioned uh, the confiscation uh, of the equipment, which basically shut down their operation for, for a time, and the actual chilling effect that people are just afraid because they, they don't want they don't want to get arrested. So, and the implementation flows both ways. So in researching all this, I found uh, media reports that state, individual state legislatures actually contacted DNR asking them to pursue enforcement of this law. So, um, uh, and, and the flow from the hunting rights interests are what I call attaboy. So they call up the legislator. Hey, thanks for contacting DNR. He did a great job. He solved our, our, our problem with the animal, animal rights activists, et, et, et cetera. So, and of course, uh, the budget is also controlled. So DNR wants to grow their power, their influence, their organization. They're dependent upon the budget. So it's this symbiotic relationship. I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, that, that, that results in the agency capture. And as I mentioned before, this is a significant judicial blow. You know, our founding fathers with checks and balances, this is what they intended the judiciary to do. When the state legislature oversteps their bounds and um, freedom of speech um, is one of our most in, in, important constitutional rights. It really is because people cannot exercise their rights or don't even know what their rights are unless, unless people like Mr. Brown can go out there and show what what they're actually doing.
Well, actually, John, you mentioned other states, you know, have similar laws and similar yeah. situations of capture. Has this decision already affected the laws in other states? You, do you think it will? Well, there's, 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 uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm also not as optimistic as I should be. There are 38 states out there that actually have uh, these, uh, uh, and what what um, you guys have done with with uh, just just naming naming this webinar Hunter Protection. It's a genius of issue framing because that's what it really is. It's a protection of special minority interests. Uh, they like to frame it as hunting interference, and the language that you use triggers different uh, cognitive connections in your in your brain, but. Um, it's uh, as Mark can expand on if he wants to. It's binding only in the seventh district, which is Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. Both of those other states do have hunter protection laws, but uh, mostly I think Illinois is like a downstate thing. Um, most hunters in Chicago probably go up to Wisconsin um, to to hunt. That there's not a lot going on in northern northern Illinois, but um, I. I had concerns. Um, I have concerns that if this makes it <clears throat> to the U.S. Supreme Court, that the conservative six-three majority might try to overturn this. One one of the best predictors of the of the Supreme Court hearing a case is when you have con conflicting decisions in different appellate districts. So this one is a powerful one, as Mark. Um, identified it was constitutionally sound in the reasoning in in the opinion but if i can briefly talk you you also asked about what dnr can do uh, um, this this should be a wake-up call along with another steets versus frost case which was a second amendment fourth amendment challenge that also judge Connolly dismissed on standing grounds um, or at least in part on standing grounds. Um, DNR needs to, uh, all organizations have their own culture and their own mission. And DNR really needs to revisit this. Um, in, in researching the webinar, the numbers are pretty overwhelming. Nationwide outdoor recreation that includes birding, hiking, all kinds, $800 billion. Uh, nation, nationwide is generated. For birding alone, $14 billion more than hunting, $41 billion. There are eight birders for every hunter in the United States. And in, in line with this viewpoint discrimination, I think DNR really needs to revisit this and consider alternative uses mm -hmm. rather than uh, just managing resources uh, uh, natural resources, which belong to everyone in favor of hunters. Yeah, I, I like that framing because then even though they have this commoditization mindset, you're speaking in yeah. their terms. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, my experience, and granted, this is anecdotal, but they really commoditize nature. Mm -hmm. That deer only have value as a head on the wall or, or meat. And I, like I said, I seldom hear them. Uh, um, talk, talk about me, but um, um, if, if we make it to that question, I can also talk about how I think that the original 1990 law is, is constitutionally deficient in, at least in the manner the way DNR applies. I, I get the whole physical interference thing, it's in the state constitution, but the way DNR uh, enforces this, even on private property, not public lands is constitutionally suspect. Yeah. Yeah. So we only have maybe 15 minutes. I do want to save some time for uh, questions from other folks. Sure. So I'm going to one more question, kind of like maybe broad, maybe to both of you. Um, and I'll let you guys choose what parts of this you want to answer. So we haven't really gotten into the overbreadth and vagueness as much as I had hoped in this short time. So one one thing that we wanted to talk about was the nexus between those two ideas and how the difference between overbreadth and vagueness. But I'm also really interested in hearing more about um, the potential circuit split and laws in other states and you know how kind of reading tea leaves going forward. Um, so yeah, 
I'll, I'll take those in reverse order. Uh, we we now are seeing the potential for more circuit splits because we've had uh, at least for a four year period some really really ideologically oriented judges appointed, and uh, the, some of those, uh, like for example, the Fifth Circuit is now dominated uh, by Trump appointed judges, uh, and and it is you just that's a sore spot for me, Mark. I have. Pardon? I got punted on a First Amendment in the Fifth Circuit um, for standing. So <laughs> with a Trump uh, appointee on my right. panel. <laughs> well, and, 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 and yeah. it is, uh, and, and there's no, uh, there's, it's no surprise that the dissenter here uh, was uh, was a Trump appointee. Uh, there, there are, and, the, the, and, and I think that there are going to be more and more of those circuit splits and circuit splits. Uh, John is 100% right is that if they're uh, on a federal issue, even if you're talking about the interpretation of different state laws, if a federal uh, provision like the First Amendment is being applied uh, uh, differently in different circuits, you know, it doesn't happen immediately. These these uh, so-called circuit conflicts or circuit splits, the Supreme Court has always been in favor of letting them build up over time until you know the gears get stuck and won't move and then the supreme court will take a case and clear the log jam uh now uh i think that that's more likely simply because you have you know some panels that are going to be uh, uh applying the law uh you know and, and again this doesn't happen with every trump appointed judge because i've gotten good uh, uh at least good constitutional decisions out of a trump appointed judge in an election case uh, brought by Donald J. Trump for president, so uh, you know there there are there are there are still judges who will follow the law no matter where it leads. But the uh, the 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 likelihood of that happening is is uh, uh, you know it, it's almost a another flip of the coin. And the uh, the there are circuits uh, and uh, and district courts that have. That would not have reached the result that uh, that the Seventh Circuit reached here, and you know, obviously, you know, it seems to me, you know, I, I was shocked when we got the summary judgment decision, because I thought, you know, you're not going to find too many examples of a law that is more clearly deficient because it does aim at suppressing one side of the debate and boosting the other, and yeah. uh, the state is supposed to keep its hands off the scale. So that's actually something I not my own, it definitely is my own ax to grind. So can you mention something about how uh, how the legislative history came into play in the um, court's analysis, like both in, in terms of the dissent and the uh, the main argument? I think, you know, the the main opinion said, you know, it shows that the, the legislative history shows it was motivated by improper, improper purpose and shows that intent. And I think on the flip side, the dissent said, you can't look at you can't impute. The well, there is no such you know, but this is a, this is a, a an example of sophistry, because judges will use when they want to use legislative history, yeah. they'll stand on one person's uh, uh, statement. Yeah. Uh, they won't have any trouble doing that, but uh, but they uh, but when they don't want to use legislative history, you pull out an argument like, well, you can't, you know, just because uh, Senator X stood up and spoke in favor of this law and it was later passed, you can't attribute that to every member of the legislature. And the point is, you know, no one says that is how it's done, but it's it's done in a, in a way that is much more geared toward actual historians. You know, you look at what people say and then at what they do. And, and you look at the, uh, you look at the, uh, 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 the, the, the normal inferences that we draw and when people in a legislature stand up and say, here's why I introduced this bill to stop that damn wolf patrol. And other people stand up and say, I agree, we have to stop this. This yeah. is against what Wisconsin stands for. Uh, to ignore that is just folly. Uh, it's intellectually dishonest. And I think that the judges uh, and the majority were quite correct. And I think that you use the evidence you have, because if you don't you know, if you don't consult that, there is no congressional record at the state level. Uh, there, there is no formal source of legislative history uh, at any state level that I know of. And so what you're doing basically 
uh, uh, notwithstanding that it is difficult to, to establish the intent of any collective body, uh, when you take that attitude at the state level, you're essentially saying we will never consider legislative intent or history at all because it just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. yeah, ridiculous. I was just wondering if I could comment on some of the Q&A and the, the chat. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, we can. I, uh, Matt, if every anyone can read it, ha has, has a really good idea to try to sever um, some of the money that that flows into uh, 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 bureaucratic agencies like DNR that come from uh, hunting tax and, and permits and stuff and, and try to link it to uh, um, pur a purchase of binoculars or, or um, something like that. That's a very good um, idea and a shout out to mark that tammy baldwin supports wolf hunting that that shows the power of the the hunting culture that she she'll she'll vote um on on many um environmental bills but um there there's a limit to how far she's willing to go and lastly uh lucy uh, a shout out i encourage you um to, to email me so I can hear more about your story. Uh, she uh, apparently, let me call it back up here, was um, arrested for on private property. And that's, that is the constitutionally deficient uh, portion of the Wisconsin law that I, I feel the state of Wisconsin cannot put restrictions on the use of private property to convey a hunting benefit on the public without per the fifth amendment providing somebody with compensation for the diminished value. So to give an example, uh, if someone is hunting off of somebody's property line or their driveway, they have to stop and walking their dog interferes with somebody's hunt. Um, DNR is very, very aggressive in, in doing this. And it sounds like something like that ha happened to, to, to Lucy that, um, it's just normal use. Uh, you know, I get it. If you're banging drums or pots and pans or got an air horn I, or even a boom box, I, I certainly get all that in terms of physical interference. But um, the way DNR in Wisconsin um, um, applies this law, it, it, is, it is, I believe, putting serious restriction, unconstitutional restriction on private property. So and that, that's an interesting angle, John, because yeah. the uh, that was that argument was not made. Uh, and you, you're probably familiar with the case in which the uh, Wisconsin Court of Appeals said, hey, no problem. We're going to, uh, you know, this might have some constitutional problems, but we're going to read this physical interference requirement into the statute. And uh, and, yeah. there, and it said thumbs up on the old pre amendment 1990. Yeah. But that doesn't touch at all doesn't even uh, uh, get into uh, the situation that you're talking about where the state is actually st telling people, hey, yes, I know it's your property, but uh, you know you can't uh, you can't do this because it's interfering sure. with the Sure, and I can't remember if you brought it up or Amanda brought it up, but this, this ability for individual hunters kind mm -hmm. of mirroring what's going on with abortion in the state of Texas, where you allow an individual to um, sue somebody. And that's a chilling effect, too, because people you have to hire a lawyer, which costs money. Uh, if you're going to be held accountable for three thousand, five thousand, whatever it is. And what happens is people of uh, I'm I'm just going to stay in Chicago for hunting season so I don't have to deal with this or or um, what, D, uh, what a DNR agent uh, or warden actually told me, you know, do what I do. I stay in the house and turn on all the lights during the hunting season. He actually said that to me in, in terms of using uh, pri private property during the hunting season. Um, so, um, yeah, if Lucy is out there, um, certainly email me. I'm interested in what happened on private property in your case. And um, we, we can uh, 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 converse on that.
you know, outside the context of the webinar. So that kind of related to one of my other questions. And, you know, maybe Lucy's doesn't, I don't know if that can be construed as a, a First Amendment protection, but I, I'm curious about what the threshold is for First Amendment protection for activities necessary to produce and disseminate speech. And a follow-up kind of is, you know, if the plaintiffs hadn't been journalists or hadn't had plans to use that footage, uh, would, would you have been more worried about defendants' argument that their activities were pure conduct? and thus not protected by the First Amendment. In this case, I still would have been pretty optimistic because the Seventh Circuit had, a, and still has, a precedent called uh, 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 ACLU versus Alvarez that had to do with filming the police in public. And uh, Chicago passed an ordinance. <laughs> Obviously, they didn't like that very much when they were being, uh, when they were being videotaped and uh, they got their buddies on the city council Pass an ordinance uh, prohibiting, uh, uh, you know, and, and it, it, can, it was written like a time, place, and manner ordinance, but it was written in such a way as to give uh, extensive, if not unlimited, discretion about actually enforcing those alleged time, place, and manner rules. And the Seventh Circuit in the Alvarez case said, you know, number one, you are right, this is not publishing or speaking or writing the traditional kinds of, you know, the cases that that make up the, the fodder of First Amendment law. But uh, if you cannot gather, if you cannot film, if you can't interview, if you can't photograph, if you can't tape, you got nothing to write about. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the uh, acts that are uh, preparatory to publication are protected. And uh, and at least in in uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, and uh, and uh, Indiana, and in some of the other circuits as well, uh, those circuits have uh, extended uh, full First Amendment protection to these activities, despite the fact that they are not, you know, directly uh, involved in the freedom of speech or of the press, you know, speaking and printing. Um, we just have a few minutes left. Um, I want to either open it up for any like final comments that you guys might have. If you want to briefly cover the vagueness of her breath, or if you want to kind of, yeah, <laughs> I, I had my own, my own question regarding, you know, would we have been equally happy if the opinion almost formed like a declaratory judgment wherein they like outlined this definitely won't apply and then can you use an opinion to kind of protect you and say oh well this exists so that's my chief my, well, my the, the, the reason there. the reason i wouldn't have been satisfied with that is is the reason uh that ties back to the fact and the court emphasized this that nobody would give the kind of you know, everybody was saying, well, that act that you did in the past doesn't violate the statute or what you were doing there, what they told uh, 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 the gentleman who ran Wolf Patrol, uh, what they told him, no, that doesn't violate it. But nobody was saying in the future, if you do this again, mm -hmm. we will not prosecute you. And those and are really facial re relief here and not just as applied too, right? Correct. And, and that's what makes this so important and why that was such a big factor in this case was the state and and its uh, its uh, uh, lesser uh, you know local law enforcement, both the DNR and uh, the AG and the sheriffs. Nobody would come forward and say we will not prosecute you if you do this again. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. uh, and, th and that was a huge huge uh, issue uh, because uh, you know you cannot then operate without. Uh, Without you know the 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 kind of uh, uh, um, the, the the kind of uh, of, of uh, attention from the court that uh, that you get here, we do have a question about people hunting on private property if the property owner isn't in favor of it. If that's trespass, if you are if you own private property that is uh, that you don't want people to hunt on, you have the right to exclude them from hunting. You have the right to exclude them from walking, from birding, from uh, you know, from pretty much anything. You are you as a property owner have that right. Uh, that right in some areas of the state is uh, honored far more in the breach than the observance, uh, if only because a lot of good hunting land is very hard for the owner to observe and monitor. That's one of the reasons they put cameras up these days.
Um, I think we're about at time. Um, so I wanted to thank both Mark and John so much for this really interesting discussion. I wish we had many, many more hours. I think we could keep going. Um, so to that end, um, I think folks can feel free to reach out to any one of the panelists today. I provided the uh, email addresses there. So um, this is such an important case, and this was such an amazing discuss discussion. Thank you so much, John and Mark, for your time. Thank You're you most guys. welcome. I've really enjoyed it. And again, if you Anybody who does have questions uh, about any aspect of the case, please feel free to contact me, uh, and uh, and I'll, uh, I'll I'll give you uh, whatever assistance and help that I can. Yeah, Thanks sure. For... Feel feel free to email me at uh, um, uh, at uh, the posted Gmail account there, or you can look me up on UIC and to my UIC. Dot edu. Just put a webinar in the subject line so I can, you know, distinguish it from, you know, all the stuff that I get. Excellent. Well, thank you, John, Amanda, and Mark. Definitely appreciate you all taking your time and sharing your wisdom with us today. And thank you to everyone out there who joined us. We definitely appreciate each and every one of you.